Today is going to be epic because I'm finally back to do the longer term review of the ICAN Aero 35 wheel set that I've been riding for about three and a half months now. Anyway, peaktalk.com, the website, and patreon.com forward slash peaktalk where you can find more about the aero testing and all the physical testing that I'm doing. ICAN wheels, who are they and why do I have them? Well, ICANN apparently were founded in 2019. They employ around 200 plus people. They make 1,700 frames and 2,000 wheel sets per month, according to the website. Now that tells me that they should have some sort of OEM capability as well, because to support those figures with just their own B2C business, I think, well, that's quite impressive. They're based in Shenzhen in China, or Sunzun if you're Cantonese. Distribution in the US, EU, UK, Australia, and in Spain, apparently. So there's warehouses in all those places for you to get, you know, locally shipped wheels with, I think, no import duty. They also, weirdly, on their website, have complete bikes for sale. All of the companies that send me wheels to test, they say, can you do a video and put a discount code on? We'll give you, you know, a discount code to give your customers if you do a wheel set review. <laughs> no, because what happens if it's shit? So I'm testing them first, making sure they're not shit. And in summary, they're not shit, but there's a few things you need to know about. Uh, PT review, who and why am I? Why am I doing this? Well, I put this in the last wheel video. I'm not gonna linger on this again. You can pause the video here and read about it. It's a different marketing strategy for smaller brands. They come to me and the hope is I give them this kind of product development and critical review, right? I'm not just going to pump out what they're you know, going to tell me. The hope is I'm pushing for better products by being harsh. I think they see the value of that. The Western brands, they don't, but fuck them. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like these really in-depth wheel videos. I mean, I try and do in-depth videos, whatever, but I've got this kind of wheel video down to a, a bit of an off-pat technique now, so hopefully they're getting shorter and less boring. Um, a summary before we really start on the data, uh, the surprisingly good aero performance of such a shallow wheel. I did so many repeats on these wheels in my aero protocol because I couldn't quite believe the data. And that's not just saying that they spin up well, they hold speed, they are just good wheels. The performance for a 35 mil wheel set is, is quite staggering and I put that down to a few things which we'll discuss in a minute but they're not too wide and um, they're just quite clean, they have a very good tyre transition. Anyway, I think the internal width supports that, it's 20, 21.5 internally. Um, the rims and the spokes are solid, like I can't mention a bad thing about the rims and the spokes, because you've got CX Ray spokes, and they make so many of these rims, they're just pretty good. Obviously they've got paint on them, so I can't actually see the raw carbon finish, and I haven't put a boroscope inside because I don't really believe that shows you too much about the internal structure. Price, 622 USD, with a discount code if you can get it, hang around for that. And the weight, 1,359, is pretty much spot on the claims before I put the rim tape on. And they come with this kind of tubeless compatible rim tape in the box which you have to put on yourself. I'm never gonna use them tubeless, so I just put it on as rim tape and it's, it's been fine. It hasn't really pushed into the spoke holes in the three months I've used it and I've been using pretty high pressures. A few things like nailed end caps and the axles are raw, they're not anodized. And that's one of the bugbears about hub design. I really don't like to see raw aluminium axles because they're quite soft and they'll gall and fret in the steel races in the bearing. You won't notice it in the first couple of months, but if you're gonna have these wheels for three or four years, that's something you really wanna have is, an, is a harder finish to the axle because it takes so much shit and load and fretting and micro bending that not having an old axle can be problematic in the long run. Like I said, I'm not just gonna do a glowing review without testing them like a lot of YouTubers do. And all that testing's been done in the UK. Sciatic road conditions, what does that mean? Well, really bad roads, rough roads, potholes, done quite a lot of gravel riding on it before it got too sloppy on the gravel um, and started at the end of summer and now it's middle of winter so I've gone through pretty much all weathers apart from snow but that is coming. Done the stiffness test on the stiffness rig which you can see here we'll get into that in a minute. Spoke tension balance like I do on all the wheels measure them check the standard deviation check the five percent rule and now for the first time in a wheel review I've done proper outdoor repeatable aero testing to uh, deduce the CDA changes of these wheels versus other wheels with a control tire, which is a GP5028, which I believe is a perfect fit for these. And that is the tire that has such a good transition on this rim, and I'll put something in about that now. And that testing is backed up by Aerolab, validated and supported by Aerolab. They sent me the equipment, and so big thanks to them, and the patrons as well for making it possible. Quick look at the rim construction. It's an asymmetric profile. What does that mean? Well, the spokes don't lie on the center line of the rim. They are offset to one side. What can that do? It helps balance the spoke tension from the drive side to the non-drive side or on the front wheel from the disc side to the non-disc side. 
It makes the angles more similar, giving the lateral components of the tension in the spokes more of a chance to be equal. And I think in this wheel set, the stiffness does benefit from that, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, like I said, the GP5000 28mm tyres, such a good transition. The Novatec type hubs have Japanese uh, EZO steel type bearings in them. There, were no, there was no grease under the end caps, which I really didn't like. Spokes 24 on the front, 24 on the rear. That's pretty much dead standard across the industry for a, a steel spoked uh, disc brake wheel. And I had no kind of spoke rubbing issues at the crosses on the rear wheel ever. Not that I could hear anyway. The hubs, I think, have good preload tolerance. Now, if you haven't seen my preload video on hubs and why it gives stiffness to a wheel and longevity to a wheel, click here or here somewhere, I'll try and drop it in. Things I don't like, knurled end caps on both sides of the front. Now, I've gone on ad infinitum about knurled end caps on wheels, and especially when they're going into carbon frames. The dropouts in the carbon frames are quite soft. Carbon doesn't like kind of face compression or you know, crushing, and these are just too severe, I think, for carbon frames. And especially if you're traveling with the bike a lot, getting the wheels in and out, putting it in the back of the car a lot, or traveling to ride, it's just not very nice. And I don't think they're necessary. With the proper clamping load, 12 Newton meters on a through axle, nailed end caps, I just think they're not necessary, and they do eat away at carbon dropouts. And then when they eat away at the carbon dropouts, what does that affect? It affects the disc brake alignment. So if you make your drop out thinner and the next time you clamp up it comes in slightly more, the pads are slightly more misaligned with the disc because the disc isn't going to change. No labyrinth seals on the end caps, there's only just one flange. Now a labyrinth seal is really good uh, way to kind of waterproof a hub or help waterproof a hub or weatherproof a hub without adding too much drag because it's basically a non-contact seal. Um, you create a quite convoluted path for dirt and debris to get in and sometimes you hope that a layer of grease or oil or whatever type of lubricant you've got in there can make an actual waterproof seal and it just helps now i've seen a lot of hubs with kind of a double flange labyrinth seal and these don't um, there's an o-ring on the inside but there's really nothing on the outside and there's no weatherproofing they didn't add any extra grease before putting the end caps on and that is just i think a little bit criminal to be honest raw axles like i said no anodized they can fret and wear over time it's best just to anodize the axle you will get a few more rejects in qc because after you anodize the surface finish changes slightly and the diameter tolerance can change a little bit. We're talking a couple of microns, but it can change, but it's well worth doing. And I think more hub manufacturers, like high-end hub manufacturers, are always doing it. And it does separate the high end from the low end, but these are built to a price. And one thing on the rear hub, which I mentioned in the original video, is the lack of clamping area on the rear end cap. The rear end cap, one of them's threaded on, and it basically leaves you very little clamping area on the end cap. When it goes in the dropout, the face pressure, so the stress, the surface stress on the dropout is gonna be quite high. Um, I really don't like that because it's, again, carbon dropouts are soft. A lot of bikes come in full carbon dropouts now, and I don't think it's a good idea. Other drawback is very, very tight tire fitting. Now, this has been kind of ubiquitous since tubeless tires became really popular and rims were made to accommodate tubeless tires. And all the 15 years of me riding road bikes, I've never really, needed a tire lever. I can always do tires with my thumbs until the last couple of years and rims seem to be getting tighter, tires seem to be getting tighter, even non-tubeless ones, but the rims are accommodating tubeless so they're making them extra tight and it just seems to be really annoying if you're not using tubeless. One good point now, CX Ray spokes. They're a thin gauge spoke made you know, with large stretch for a given tension. It makes for a very comfortable wheel. I found that with carbon spokes, and I've said this in all the carbon spoke wheel video reviews that I've done, I think I have to compromise on rolling resistance by dropping the pressure so much to make the carbon spoke wheel comfortable. Um, with the carbon spoke wheels, if I'm not riding on really smooth roads, let's say I'm going out for an all road ride or maybe even a bit of gravel thrown in or potholes or just bad roads, the max pressure I can really run on my TCR with the ISP is 75 PSI on the rear to make it comfortable. Um, with these wheels, I feel like on a good road, I can push the pressure higher and not suffer when I hit the bad road. So I think I'm getting better rolling resistance on these wheels than a carbon spoke wheel. There's higher inherent stretch in a steel spoke like a CX Ray versus a carbon spoke. And why is that good? Well, they're less likely to come loose for a forced displacement input. So let's say you hit a pothole, the whole rim moves a little bit by one millimeter. Some, you know, the rim edge compresses by one millimeter. One millimeter of you know, detensioning in this might only affect the tension by 20 kilos of force or something. One millimeter in a carbon spoke detensioning might detension the whole spoke and it might come completely loose. So if you're looking for these for all road or gravel riding or something, I would probably stick with steel spokes. They are more robust, they are more forgiving because they've just got more flex. Getting onto the spoke balance test. This is my spreadsheet for the ICANN Aero 35. I measured all the spoke tensions when they came out of the box. This is before riding. There's a few outliers. So on the top here, you've got 
the front wheel, uh, disc side and non-disc side, and on the bottom half of this page, you've got the rear wheel, uh, disc side and non-disc side again. Um, there's one outlier on the rear wheel on each side, and there's two outliers on the front wheel on each side. Now, that's okay. I've been pretty strict with the 5% limit, and the st standard deviation is about 0.5 for all of these. Now, this is what an exemplary wheel set should look like. All spokes within 5% limit of the mean. Standard deviation is much, much lower, kind of 0.3 across the board. Okay, there's one that's 0.5 on the rear wheel, but in general, that is an exemplary spoke balance test. Now, that could have been a Peak Talk special. Who knows, that is the Windspace Hyper 2023, the Gen 2. And what you want to see here on the front wheel is that the non-disc sides are all lower than the disc side tension. You'd expect that because the geometry gives them a higher component of lateral force that way anyway. So you'd expect these to be lower than this side. If, if we measured any of these higher than that side, that would kind of ring alarm bells. And it goes for the rear wheel as well. The drive side, you'd expect to be all higher tension than the non-drive side. If that was, if you had any crossings in these lines, then that would be kind of be alarm bells that the tolerances weren't very good. The wheels are exactly true and they still are exactly true. And spoke tension, tolerances and trueness are all mutually exclusive. You can't kind of fudge it. If the tolerances are bad and you make the spoke tensions equal, the wheel won't be in true. If the wheel is true and the spoke tensions are not equal, then there's some slight tolerance discrepancy. But in general, these are pretty good. Now, moving on to Peak Torque Wheels Lateral Stiffness Test, and this is unpreloaded, which means I haven't applied a weight before measuring the displacement, and I think that's important because as you're sprinting side to side, you do flip-flop around that zero point. And you can see on here, I've got all the wheels I've tested so far. I've got the ICANs labeled in purple and a few other wheels on here, which you've probably already seen the video for. The wheels on the right, after the Fast Sport Von 2 and further to the right, they're all rim brake wheels. Uh, all the wheels on the left of that are disc brake wheels. And you can see the ICANN arrows are pretty kind of in the middle of the road. Now, you might think they don't look very stiff on here, but a lot of the wheels on this board are, are with carbon spokes and they are stiffer. So as you can see by this plot, all the carbon spoke wheels I tested are in pink. And in general, they just have a much higher lateral stiffness than the uh, steel spoke wheels, and that's to be expected. Now, is stiffness good? Like I said, I think if the wheels are too stiff, you have to compromise on tire pressure, drop the tire pressure, and then you start penalizing yourself and rolling resistance. So if this is an all road gravel wheel set, the fact that they don't have carbon spoke, I think is very good. Now for a shallow wheel, the spokes are gonna be longer, which means they have more total stretch. So you'd expect a long spoke and a shallow wheel to be slightly less stiff in the lateral stiffness test. But these are actually really good, and I think that's helped, first of all, by quite high building tensions especially on the rear wheel. And I think this offset uh, drilling on the, on the rim definitely helps lateral stiffness test because it balances the spoke tensions left and right. And these results are an average of testing the rim that way. And then I flip over and test the other way. And it also means you can build the whole thing to a higher tension anyway. So moving on to the aero testing, you may have seen the aero diaries that I do on Patreon of, of me testing this specific wheel set. Well, I guess it's time now to present this video sponsor, which is Peak Talk and the Patrons. Big thanks to all the Patrons on patreon.com forward slash Peak Talk for getting me out there, spurring me on to do all this data collection. I am spending a lot of time processing reams and reams of data so I can present it to you in a nice, easily digestible graphical format. They help me buy the control tires, the GP5028, which aren't cheap. And yeah, it just kind of makes this all worthwhile, really. Um, so please do like and subscribe if you like this kind of thing and head over to Patreon, my Patreon. I'll leave the link in the description if you want to see more of the protocol, the nitty gritty. Big shout out to Aerolab for their support and the equipment in gathering all this data. Each data point on here is a test session. Now within those test sessions are different laps and each lap has a CDA. But these are the average CDAs of each test session on different days. And I've also plotted the average yaw for each session as well. So you can see I've got tests between kind of four and eight degrees of yaw. Now th those yaw figures are actually quite high. At this time of year, it has been very blustery. Um, obviously the faster you go, the less the yaw, because the apparent wind, the faster you go comes around to zero. But even so, I was traveling about 35, 36 k's an hour for most of these tests, which is kind of the control speed. Um, the test isn't out and back dead straight, and there has been some very severe crosswinds, which is why the yaw does go up to about eight degrees. This doesn't mean anything on its own, obviously, but if we take the average CDA of all these sessions and contextualize them against some other results, this is what we get. So on this graph, I've plotted the aero watts of this wheel, which is the wattage you need to produce minus the drivetrain friction and minus the rolling resistance. The dotted line at the bottom represents kind of the average test speed. And on there, I've plotted the best in test to date and the worst in test to date. And I've also plotted for context, the ICANN Aero 35s, 
riding in the drops. So my CDA figures when I'm riding in the drops. Now, you can see between um, the best and the worst, they're kind of somewhere in the middle. And the fact that they're one of the shallowest wheels I've ever tested is a testament to how good they are. And I don't know if they've done that by design or it's fluke, but they are very, very, very good for a shallow wheel. They are testing better than a lot of deeper wheels, especially at the higher yours. And what they don't tell you, and this is one of the things I found from all the aero testing, is that they don't tell you in the marketing wind tunnel fancy graphs that all the wheels come with now is that deep wheels, you really, really have a much smaller window for them to operate faster in. If you're gonna have wind conditions from ever end, particularly very, very strong crosswinds, the deep wheels really penalize you with that kind of pressure drag on the leeward side of the wheel. You're much better off going for a much shallower wheel, an all-round wheel, which is why these test so well in quite high yaw conditions. In a dead zero test, they are obviously not faster than a deep wheel. And I will reveal which the fastest and the slowest wheels are when you see the other wheel sets coming through and you'll be able to piece together which one was which. There are about six watts, five or six watts off the best in test, and they're about 10 watts better than the worst but you can see, if you just want to ride in the drops, you're going to go a lot faster. Now, you might say, why, the, why is the wattage for the drops position only a little bit better? Well, my bike position is kind of optimised for road bike TT for parallel forearms on the hoods position, which means I've got the stem quite low. So I'm already in a very, very low position. Now, when I go to the drops, I don't actually get that much lower because I've got a shallow drop handlebar. But what I do do is make my arms almost straight down, so quite a short reach actually for my height, quite a short reach. And when I'm in the drops, my forearms and my upper arm are basically vertical and air hates going around cylinders. So there's actually less drag on my arm system alone when I'm riding on the hoods, when I'm riding in the drops. If you just took the drag on my arm, it would be higher because my drop has a much steeper angle of inclination to the wind and the wind doesn't like going around cylinders. It creates a lot of drag like that, which is why my drop position off the top of my head is only about 20 watts faster at 35 k's now. One other thing I need to mention about this is disc alignment. And this has become increasingly frustrating as I've been testing so many wheels. And because I just have one disc brake bike, which I ride all year round, I ride it through the summer. I do kind of crits on it. I do road bike TTs on it. I do a bit of gravel riding on it because it's the TCR. It's quite a versatile bike with loads of tire clearance. I pretty much do loads of stuff on it. And I'm doing all the wheel testing. I need to be able to change wheels pretty quickly and regularly. Now, what becomes apparent is that some hubs don't have the same disc alignment that other hubs do and it becomes quite annoying that you have to keep changing the caliper. You actually have to sort of undo the caliper and realign it or you have to push the pads back out, reset the pistons and then pump them to kind of suit the new rotor. Now, I don't know which is right because I don't have the Shimano drawing but consistent with each other on disc brake alignment are DT240, DT350, both the Windspace Hyper Generation, Shimano Ultegra and Extra Light. Those are the ones I've either built wheels for, for other people and tested in my bike, or I've just got experience of. Not consistent with those is these wheels, the ICANN slash Novatech hubs, uh, the Elite hubs and Tune King slash Kong. Now those are quite expensive, those Tune King Kong hubs, and I recently built those into a wheel set for someone else. And yeah, they are quite far off as well. And this all comes back to, um, I've put you know, a datum A on the disc brake rotor mounting surface, but what it actually comes down to is the preload position where the bearings are in the hub and how much the end caps actually clamp onto the inner races of the bearings to kind of set all the preload of the hub. Now, if those things aren't consistent between brands, the disc ends up in a different position relative to the caliper and you have to reset the caliper. So it clearly hasn't been standardized across all brands. Obviously you can set a datum as a kind of standard, like the disc rotor must be this many millimeters, 0.00 away from the dropout, but it's interpreted differently by different manufacturers and it depends on how much preload you've got and the condition of the bearing. If you've got a zero clearance bearing versus a very, very sloppy clearance bearing like a C5, then the final position is all gonna change. And this is one thing that's really annoying about disc brakes. Quick summary then, great rim, really happy with that. Great spokes, favorite spoke in the world, the CX-Ray, and the price is really good especially with my discount code peak torque. There it is, I've said it. Decent spoke balance, a few 5% outliers, but not many. Decent stiffness for the depth as well, and I think they've achieved that by having the asymmetric rim profile. Um, nailed end caps, don't like that. Lack of grease, that's just something really, really simple. Before putting the end caps on, they should put grease in it from the factory. So if you buy these, I suggest you do that. The raw axle, I think it's gonna be fine. For most people, it's gonna be fine, but we're really getting into the nitty gritty of these things. Tire fitting is very tight, like I said. 
and the disc alignment is a minor point. But if this is your only wheel set, you don't need to worry about that. I'll put the product link in the description below. Pretty good wheel set for the money. I think you struggle to get better for the money. For 600 odd USD, you're not gonna get anything like a DT240 or a really high-end hub on a wheel set. And look forward to seeing you in the next one.